Chapter 124 The Worship Center, Part 2 Exodus chapter 38, verses 1 to 31 And he made the altar of burnt offering of shittim wood, five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof, it was four square, and three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns thereof on the four corners of it, the horns thereof were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots, and the shovels, and the basins, and the flesh hooks, and the fire pans, all the vessels thereof made he of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network under the compass thereof beneath unto the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass to be places for the staves. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar to bear it withal. He made the altar hollow with boards. And he made the laver of brass, and the foot of it of brass, of the looking-glasses of the woman assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he made the courts on the south side southward, the hangings of the courts were of fine twined linen, an hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their brazen sockets twenty, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side the hangings were an hundred cubits, their pillars were twenty, and their sockets of brass twenty, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the east side eastward fifty cubits. The hangings of the one side of the gates were fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the other side of the court gate, on this hand and that hand, were hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. All the hangings of the court roundabouts were of fine twined linen. And the sockets for the pillars were of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver, and the overlaying of their chapiters of silver, and all the pillars of the courts were filleted with silver. And the hanging for the gate of the courts was needlework of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen and twenty cubits with the length, and the height in the breadth was five cubits answerable to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were four, and their sockets of brass four, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their chapiters, and their fillets of silver. And all the pins of the tabernacle, and of the court round about, were of brass. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony, as it was counted, according to the commandment of Moses, for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son to Aaron the priest, and Bezalel the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a cunning workman, and an embroiderer in blue and in purple, and in scarlet and fine linen. All the gold that was occupied for the work in all the work of the holy place, even the gold of the offering, was twenty and nine talents and seven hundred and thirty shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was an hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and threescore and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary a banker for every man, that is, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that went to be numbered from twenty years old and upward, 
for 600,000 and 3,550 men. And of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary, and the sockets of the veal, and hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. And of the thousand seven hundred seventy and five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, and overlaid their chapiters, and filleted them. And the brass of the offering was seventy talents, and two thousand and four hundred shekels. And therewith he made the sockets of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the brazen altar, and the brazen grate for it, and all the vessels of the altar. And the sockets of the court round about, and the sockets of the court gate, and all the pins of the tabernacle, and all the pins of the court round about. Exodus chapter 38, verses 1 to 31. Sometimes commentators on this chapter limit themselves to statements about the materials used. J.P. Hyatt estimated that 1,900 pounds of gold, 6,437 pounds of silver, and 4,522 pounds of bronze were used. H. L. Ellison wondered if the immense value in church, plate, etc. could not be put to better use as did the communists when they came to power in Russia. To call the Bolshevik seizures of wealth better use is an amazing statement. Ellison saw the use of those things in the tabernacle as valid simply because, in the wilderness, the riches involved had no other use or value. An incredible comment. Some scholars give higher estimates of the amount of metals used. The differences are due to the variations in the reckoning of the weights at that time, that is, the talent and the shekel. The gold used, according to the statement of verse 24, was the gold of the offering, that is, the free will offering. According to verse 26, the silver used came in the main from the half shekel paid by all males aged 20 and older as their temple or governmental tax. This was the only required giving that went into the construction. In verse 8, we have a reference to ministering women who assembled by groups at the door of the sanctuary. The only other reference to this apparently organized body of women is much later, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, where we are told of the sexual abuse of these women by Eli's sons. There seems to be a reference also to these women in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38, we are told of Anna, a prophetess. Anna was a widow of about 64 years of age, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. The text in Exodus chapter 38 verse 8 indicates an organized body of women who assisted the priests and Levites. Anna seems to have been one such woman. In Acts chapter 9 verse 36, we are told of a woman at Joppa named Tabitha or Dorcas, meaning doe, a woman, full of good works and alms deeds which she did. Her death was a great loss to the community of Christians and especially all the widows who were weeping. Dorcas had been a great help to them, providing them with clothing. Verse 39 Peter raised Dorcas from the dead and then presented her to the saints and widows. Verse 41 it is possible that we have here an order of widows whose work for the church and for needy people was a continuation of what appears in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 to 16, Paul discusses the place of widows. His discussions are especially interesting because he lays down rules for an already established and functioning group. Not any widow could qualify, 
She had to be age 60, of good character, not a busybody or a gossip, and also needy. There is every reason to believe that we have an order well known in Israel which was continued by the Christian church or synagogue. Later, the Christian order of widows developed into the nuns' convents, but the age restriction was dropped in the process. With this in mind, we can see something more in the Old Testament texts. Widows were entitled to receive a portion of the third year poor tithe, according to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 29, chapter 26, verses 12 and 13. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 19, there is an especial curse on all who prevent justice for aliens, orphans, and widows. For both biblical and non-biblical Hebraic sources, we see that widows had a legal claim on society. To be mindful of the helpless was a strict moral law. The widows were thus women needing help, who were also used in serving the church. In Romans chapter 16 verses 1 and 2, Phoebe is referred to as a deacon, although some insist on reading it merely as a reference to her service to the church. However, the text does indicate that some status and authority is given to Phoebe. In verse 12, two other women are also mentioned as labouring in the Lord. We do see in Pliny's letter to Trajan, circa AD 110, a reference to young women who are called deaconesses. Later, the needy widows and the deaconesses are cited as two separate groups in the Apostolic Constitutions. In 533, the Council of Orléans referred to the widows who are called deaconesses. What we thus see is important because, first of all, at the same time that we see a vast outlay of gold and silver for the sanctuary's construction, we see evidence of care for the needy. Instead of a conflict between a wealthy sanctuary and the care of the needy, we see harmony. Second, some have questioned the validity of Exodus chapter 38 verse 8 on the grounds that an order of ministering women could not have existed before the sanctuary was built. We find, however, that ancient cultures predating Moses did make provision for the care of widows and their social function. Wherever societies were family-oriented, such care was not unusual. Modern man regards himself as advanced and superior. He finds it hard to believe that people in the past could be superior to himself. In verses 1 to 7, the construction of the altar of burnt offering is described and the vessels and instruments used with it. This altar is described in Leviticus chapter 4 verse 7 as the altar at the door. There was no approach to God except by way of atonement. The claim of the altar had to be met first. The offering required had to be given totally to God. The ancient term for it, much used in earlier centuries, is holocaust. It is an offering wholly given to God and setting forth total devotedness. The only true holocaust is the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Any other usage of the word is sacrilegious. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 refers to Jesus Christ as a holy given offering on our behalf. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Paul's Greek phrase is the same as that of the Septuagint for Leviticus chapter 1 verse 9. In verse 8, the construction of the lever of brass is cited. This lever stood between the altar and the door, and the priests had to wash themselves as they entered. 
It is referred to in Psalm 26, verse 6. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. The ceremony symbolized innocence. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 6, the elders of the city, when failing to locate a murderer, made restitution and atonement for the murderer and washed their hands to indicate their fulfillment of God's requirement whereby their innocence was accomplished. Pilate made wrongful use of this ceremony of innocence in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. The ceremony also meant that one had cleansed himself of all persons and activities which were false and polluting. In Exodus chapter 37, verses 1 to 9, the construction of the ark is described. Then in chapter 37, verses 10 to 24, the table and the lampstand, and in chapter 37, verses 25 to 28, the altar of incense. In Exodus chapter 38, we have the construction of the forecourt. In verse 21, we see that Ithamar, one of Aaron's sons, had an important part in the work. As we have seen, Exodus gives us the government and justice of God as the centre of social order and of all law. As against this, the modern world has a shift from God to the state as a centre. One result is a major instability among men and societies. While Justinian's institutes represented some dependence on Roman law, it also had a Christian emphasis. One definition tells us of this perspective. Jurisprudence is the knowledge of things divine and human, the science of the first and the unjust. Since World War II especially, Western law has been steadily purged of God's law. One whose views were very powerful in Scotland and America and whose influence is now being denied and expunged was John Knox. Of him, James K. Cameron wrote, Knox made clear the policy which he would wish to have affected in Scotland. To live according to the word of God entailed by the upholding of the validity for Christians of the Old Testament law and the responsibility of seeking from those who exercise the civil sword their full cooperation and compliance. Knox, of course, was aware that some claimed that Christians lived under a new dispensation for whom the rigour of the Levitical law had passed away. His answer to them is characteristically blunt. If ye claim any privilege by the coming of the Lord Jesus, himself will answer that he is not come to break or destroy the law of his heavenly Father. Where God's law is not at the centre of a society, the result is a struggle by men to establish their particular versions of human sovereignties and man-made laws. We are at present in the vast conflict created by the shift of centre from God's word and law to man.